At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Welcome everyone, this is another Drug Science Podcast and today I have a, a man who has recently published his autobiography. It's called Against the Grain and if you don't know who he is, I'll give you a clue. He's on the front of it riding a bicycle wearing a, a yellow scarf. And the yellow scarf, of course, represents the fact he was a, a liberal Democrat. And the man himself is Norman Baker. And uh, for those of you who don't remember, he is probably the first and last truly honest politician we've had in our lifetime. So welcome, Norman. <laughs> Thank you, Dave, for that introduction. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Norman and I go back um, to when he was an MP and uh, a Lib Dem MP for uh, Lewis. Lewis and Seaford, was it? Is that what it was called? I can't remember. Well, it's called Lewis and Constituency, uh, includes Seaford. And Seaford always gets rather upset because Seaford's much bigger than Lewis, but the constituency is called Lewis. And there's a little internal battle there. And the book title is Against the Grain, and that absolutely sums up this man. If there's, if there's anyone in politics who remotely stood up for <laughs> what the truth was on a, on a regular basis and suffered as a consequence, then it's Norman Baker. So thank you for joining me. And I want to... I want to talk through, you know, your your career and uh, your insights, and uh, you've done a number of things other outside of, um, of of politics. But but let's just should we just start with politics and sure. and, and drug drugs? Of course, you're famous as you know, you're the drugs minister who actually resigned because the government weren't weren't interested in what you were trying to even learn. Do you want to just share with us a bit of that story, Norman? Well, I was three and a half years as transport minister at uh, the Department of Transport, which was a, a joyous occasion and a happy time in the coalition because there was quite a degree of commonality over there. Um, everybody said hello to each other and smiled and was generally pleasant. Even my Tory colleagues, as it were, in the department were pretty pleasant to me and we all got on very well. And then I got promoted to uh, Minister of State, which is second tier rather than third tier, at the Home Office because Nick Clegg took the view that the liberal view of, in the Home Office wasn't being heard and we had this um, rather austere department. So I crossed the road, literally, from the Department of Transport to the Home Office <laughs> and, and went from um, the sunny beach of the Barbados to outer Siberia in terms of the temperature uh, was there. And what a department, I mean, dysfunctional department. Nobody smiled, nobody was under the cosh, nobody seemed very happy. And of course, it was uh, it was very austere indeed in terms of policy too, which is why Nick sent me there. I remember an independent, a journalist on the independent, when I was over Theresa May, I was the only liberal in the department, and he described me as the only hippie to Iron, at an Iron Maiden concert. It's quite, quite a nice <laughs> <laughs> it was my So It was rather good tough. Coat, yes. It was tough, and, and I spent over a year there, and in the end, I just I just got fed up with it. I just got I just I couldn't stick it. Every day, every day, every minute of the day was a battle, a battle with um, either the Home Secretary or with her special advisors, and to get anything done at all. And it was continually arguing about press lines, about where I was going or what meetings I was at. It was non-stop, and of course I defended my corner in a way that I think probably my predecessors hadn't bothered to do or found it too much of a challenge to do. And I just did this, and it was it was very unpleasant uh, all round, really. And I didn't feel I had to do this. So, in come the August 2014, bearing in mind the general election was coming as well, I said to Nick, I wanted to go. I had enough of it. And then um, he said, Well, look, we've got this drugs report which has been commissioned, and he'd insisted it be commissioned. It was a Lib Dem thing, and it was due to report quite shortly. And he asked me if I would stay on to make sure it wasn't buried. Uh, by the Home Office before, you know, after I left. So I agreed to stay on. Uh, we finally got it out the door 
in, um, I think it was October 2014. And uh, I resigned shortly after my last duty as a Home Office Minister was uh, actually to present the report to the House of Commons. So I think Theresa May felt I, I went rather off message, which I duly did in my uh, in my last appearance. And of course, that was a Thursday and I knew I was going to go at the weekend, I think. And nobody else knew, but I knew. So I was, I was slightly in demob happy. And then when I resigned, all hell broke loose. And uh, of course, what happened was um, my friend Andy Davy, who was a great cartoonist, cartoonist for um, at the moment for the Standard and Telegraph, I've known him since I was at college with him. So he, he uh, as soon as it became known that I'd resigned, the newsletter reported it. Within five minutes, he texted me saying, "Now that the, the shit's going to hit the fan," which it duly did. And of course, I got this massive briefing against me from um, from uh, the Home Office special advisors, and they pulled out all their friends from Fleet Street to hammer me. I had a whole page, I think, a whole page in the Times saying how unimportant I was, which is a slightly perverse. <laughs> way. Yeah, it's kind of important, quite. I remember um, I was interviewed and, and someone said to me, why did you resign? It was an obvious question I hadn't really thought about encapsulating it. And I said, it was like walking through mud. I think, oh, it just came to me at that, that, that very moment, that phrase, and that seemed to have been the, that was the one that stuck in the papers, walking through mud. And it's a very accurate description, actually, how it was at the home office. So I felt, I felt, uh, Relieved in a way not to be there any further, but I felt I'd done a good job and I, I was very pleased to get the drug support out. Well, yeah, so I think a lot of our listeners um, won't be as intimate with uh, the politics of uh, Westminster as you are, and certainly, well, certainly definitely as you are. So let's just go back to the beginnings of this. So this was the coalition government in 2010. Yeah. And one of the, the plan was that the Lib Dems would have some stake in some very important matters of state, one of which was drugs, yeah. is that right? Yes, with a huge amount of things. And one of the great frustrations is that we remember what we got wrong, uh, notably tuition fees, which we did get wrong, but no one remembers what we got right. And it all just got buried. And, you know, the fact that income tax threshold was raised for working people was us. The fact we got free school meals for children was us. Uh, the fact that there was a, the biggest real investment since Victorian times was us. You know, there's a whole range of things that we did in government, including the work on drugs, because you've got to remember that um, Theresa May and her colleagues were, you know, died in the war back in 1971, kind of, let's change nothing and drugs are evil and we must fight them, you know, with police and everything else. And that was the mentality they had. And uh, we said, hang on a minute, we want to do something else. And there was a discussion in 2010 about, our, our wish to do something. We wanted, we wanted a Royal Commission, as a matter of fact. That's what yes, we wanted, yeah. a Royal Commission. And uh, the Tories wouldn't agree to that, but they agreed to an international comparative study, which was duly carried out. And was about two thirds completed when I became a Home Office Minister. And of course, my, my position as Drugs Minister also meant that I chaired the Cabinet Committee on Drugs. So I was in a position to take things through there. Now, you know, part of the negotiations and wheeling and dealing was that I got quite a lot done through there in the sense that when Theresa May tried to stop me, I said, well, I'm doing this in my capacity as a chair of the cabinet committee of your business. <laughs> ah, I see. So you could have got freed a little bit from the constraints of the uh, of the Home Office. Huh? Well, of course, the, the report when it was published belonged to the cabinet committee, but then it was immediately handed back to the Home Office to implement. So at that point, it became a matter for the Home Office, but she couldn't stop me doing what I wanted to do in terms of producing the report. So, yes, as I remember it, the idea was that uh, you couldn't have a Royal Commission. You knew, the Lib Dems knew that drugs had, you know, it was just the drug policy wasn't working, it was going backward. Uh, the plan was to get the best evidence from overseas. And uh, yeah. and how did you go about doing that? I mean, did you did you go to places and see places? Yes, indeed. I mean, let me say that the, the civil servants in the drug section of the Home Office are very good. And I wouldn't say they were as necessarily as enlightened as, we, as perhaps you are, but they were they were professional and they were open minded, and they were prepared to follow through instructions from me as a Lib Dem member in the department, rather than taking the perhaps easy course of just doing what the Home Secretary wanted. So I had a lot of time for them, and they were good good officials, and they had to produce a support because the, uh, ultimately the international comparison support was not produced by me. I mean, I guided it, but it was written by officials, uh, which actually strengthened the case. And what they did miraculously was to write it accurately without necessarily deeply offending the Home Secretary, which is quite a skill. 
to, to in that particular case. But yes, we went abroad. I mean, some of these visits were done by Jeremy Brown, my predecessor, before I arrived. But I went, for example, to um, Denmark. I remember going to Denmark and visiting, I forgot that pastoral land in Copenhagen. Christiania. You, you, I love your description of Christiania. I've actually lectured and stayed there. It's a remarkable <laughs> place. <laughs> it's, a, it's a remarkable place and it's very central and everything else. And, and that was quite an eye opener. I mean, you know, the world wasn't falling apart. Um, people were carrying on with their normal lives. Um, society was continued to function. So, you know, the, the kind of scare stories about this were completely unfounded. I also had a very interesting meeting with um, some guy who ran a, a kind of voluntary sector thing for uh, heroin users. And he had been um, using heroin since about two or 22, I think. And he was 60 something when I met him. And he looked, he looked a picture of health. I mean, he did. And his view was that, which I hadn't appreciated, but you know, that's more than I will expect it, that heroin was or is a substance which, like food, you crave it and you have to have it in order to satisfy your appetite. But it's not actually addictive in that sense. It's a different thing. And therefore, providing you're satisfying your appetite, then you carry on as normal. And I went to one of these um, injection places, I forgot what they called. Safe injecting facilities, yeah. And it was quite astonishing. It was very clinical, literally. I mean, there was people there with, with scrubs and everything else and nurses and so on. People would come in, the place was spotless. It was quiet, it was all organized. And, you know, some would come in a, in, a, in a kind of suit with a briefcase. They put the briefcase down, they shoot up, and they go to work and do a day's work. And and this was totally alien because the image of heroin users is kind of people falling on the pavement and, you know, robbing shops and whatever it happens to me. And, and this was completely different in Denmark. So that was very interesting. I also went to um, one of the other visits I had, which was partly related to this, was to a clinic for addicts. I think it was in Kensington. When I went there, I was expecting in my naivety, I didn't expect to find cannabis users because I'm, my view is that cannabis isn't particularly harmful. But I mean, I went there expecting to find a whole lot of heroin users. And actually what I found was all alcohol users in the places of alcoholics. And the, the, the staff there said to me, it's more difficult to get people off alcohol than to get them off heroin, which is, an, you know, to me, a revelation. So I learned, even though I, I was reasonably well the verse in the issue before I started. I learned quite a bit. And I hope I was open to arguments, open to experiences, open to viewpoints. And, and uh, what I saw, I hope I, I was prepared to assimilate and change my views as, as necessary. I didn't see the same approach from the, from the Home Secretary, to be honest with you, or from her colleagues, because they had this downright view down the line that drugs are harmful and that was, that was almost the end of their argument i mean it didn't really go any further and it was almost a, a fearful thing if, unless we clamp down on this absolutely we'll get out of control and um and the world will kind of fall apart a bit like the audience about covid now to be perfectly honest with you you know that kind of fear thing that was going on and she wasn't open to evidence which is i find frustrating i don't really mind people's viewpoints I don't want people disagreeing with me or having a completely different viewpoint, provided they've got some basis to what they're saying. Um, it's, perfectly it's perfectly possible to take evidence and, and facts and, and use them to create a, a theory or, or, or interpretation from those facts. That's fine. But when, when, when you won't look at the facts, that's a different matter altogether. And of course, what the International Comparative Study showed uh, when it was put together was effectively, if I may say so, to to um, support Lib Dem policy and rubbish story policy. That's what it did. It wasn't because the officials were biased. It's simply that's what, that's what the case was. Just that's the real <laughs> And it was perfectly obvious from what was happening in Portugal in particular that where you treat drugs as, as a health issue, you not only help people far more, but you actually minimise crime and you minimise drug use. It goes down. You know, so the idea that it's a free-for-all is it's nonsense. Equally, on the other side of the coin, places like Russia, which clamped down very hard, end up with people sharing needles and getting HIV. So, I mean, it's probably obvious what the, what the answer was. So, I'll come back to some of your other activities in Parliament in a minute, but, you know, you were an MP, well, I think, for about 15 years, is that right? 18, 18, yeah. 18 years, yeah. And you have uh, the reputation, I think, for putting down more parliamentary questions than any anyone ever, ever in the previously in, in, in history, certainly in 18 years. 
Well, I wasn't counting, but I mean, parliamentary questions are a very useful and underrated tool. You can actually build a campaign over a period of time by taking the answer and moving on to the next stage, you know, on the board. And eventually, if you know what you're doing, you can strike gold. And I think, I'm very proud of the fact that I think I'm the only MP ever to have caused a ministerial resignation through a written parliamentary question, which was, it always helps to know the answer to the question you're asking, of course, that, that helps. But I asked a question about Peter Mandelson and the Millennium Dome and the Hinduja passports. Uh, because I knew, uh, well, I had very good reason to think that he lobbied on, on the Hindu chest to get their passport applications speeded up in return for a donation for the Millennium Dome, which at the time was a disaster and no one could find anything to fill it, if you remember back in like 2000, of course. And, and of course, you know, I asked a question, what representations? It then turned out subsequently, I didn't know this until afterwards, this had caused a huge row in the Home Office, actually, because the question had gone to them. Because uh, they held the passports. They had to approve the passports. That's right. right. They had to approve the, because I asked the Home Secretary the question, what representations have received from Peter Mandelson, or the member for Hartlepool. And Jack, as it turned out afterwards, Jack Straw had insisted that the question be answered. He says it's a perfectly valid question. It's, MPs are not to ask questions, it must be answered. So was Julie Anson. It revealed that he had indeed lobbied effectively uh, for the Hindujas, and uh, he had to resign. Tony Blair made him resign. Now, whether Jack Straw was being puritanical and defending Parliament just whether he's, he, you know, saw an opportunity to get one over on Peter Mandelson, I don't know. It doesn't really matter very much. But anyway, that was the Parliament's written question that caused that. And as a result of that, I got, um, I was made spectator question of the year or something, question of the year, and I won the Channel 4 Opposition Politician of the Year. So you really, the point I was really getting to really is that you were doing, a, you know, you, you were really doing your very best to try to make British political system work and you were you weren't in power so you were asking these really pertinent questions trying to make people own up to some elements of the truth and you know when you get into power you think great job I, I can now affect change but it wasn't yeah. that easy was it and I just want to want you to reflect a bit on what is this fear about rational drug policies is it all party political or is it is it some kind of moral no. problem or, or what what is it well, I mean, let me say, I achieved more in government in five years than I achieved in opposition in 13. So you can right. do things. The coalition actually made it easier because you couldn't, like, Cameron couldn't sack me because only Nick Clayton and David Cameron called me the most annoying man in Parliament. It was a lovely, lovely thing to call me. I like that very much. <laughs> Another honour. <laughs> very much an honour. Nick Clegg called me a cross between, a, a cross between Gandhi and a battering ram, which is also quite a nice phrase. <laughs> Yes, I didn't quite see the Gandhi bit, but... I, I, achieved, a lot, I, achieved, I achieved a lot in government with, uh, I have to say, the Department of Transport mostly. I achieved a huge amount of Department of Transport, and that was very satisfying. And I could do things that I've been campaigning for for years. And even at the Home Office, we moved things on, not just in the drug policy. I'll come back to that, David, in a second bit. moved it on in other areas too, in terms of trying to deal with the, the evidence arrangements in court, because... To do, I, I also had to deal with um, the, the in my portfolio violence against women, which was a pretty ghastly thing to deal with. But I mean, one of the things we actually got done was try and change the rules in court to try and stop juries assuming it because a woman wears a short skirt, she automatically wants to be raped. You know, so we just this is nonsense. This is Victorian. So we got rid of that. So we did. I, I did achieve things in in that office. I got the, um, the I got a cross part a cross governmental agreement on female genital mutilation. I agreed, all departments agreed to do something about that, which again was a major achievement, I think, in some ways. The person who wouldn't do anything about it was Michael Gove in the Education Department. So being rather belligerent, I think got every other department to sign up to and went to see Michael Gove and said, here you are, the only department not signed up. Are you signing up now? And he had to really sign at that point. So we did, you know, there were things you could do there. You could do things easier when Theresa May agreed with you. She was very good on violence, because actually, she was very sound on that issue. And I also got things done on um, another part of my portfolio that was reasonably ghastly, was child sexual exploitation. So there were things I got done in the department. It was hard work. But anyway, on drug policy, well, what I got done was a publication of that study, which I hope is, was, well, was the first independent study of drug policy since, well, I suppose, you know, for 30 odd years, 40 years, since 1971 Act, which itself was, was a terrible piece of legislation. So at least it's on the record. And I think the other thing I did with drug policy, just to say, was I, I had a representation from 
people who wanted to use cannabis for medicinal purposes. And I'm aware that that was something which many people felt was a, a very beneficial substance to use for particular conditions. And I met them in my constituency, first of all, because they were constituents. And I was very impressed with, with not just with their arguments, but with the way they presented themselves. So I arranged for them to meet the Home Office civil servants. I got them up to the Home Office to meet the civil servants. And I brought in their Department of Health as well, because they should hear this. So I brought them in at the same time and they made their presentation. And it, it clearly changed minds in the officials to hear these people. And then buoyed by this, I then raised it with Theresa May. Well, that, got, that was pointless to do that. But so anyway, it's not enough of this. So I then put something out to the press anyway, to say that should, we should be allowing this to occur, use of cannabis for medicinal purposes. And I put this in the, I think I put it in the Daily Mail. And I, I thought to myself, well, I'm doing the right thing. I'm going to get slaughtered for it, but I, at least I feel I've done the right thing. Well, to my astonishment, all the papers, without exception, were sympathetic. They were either overtly in agreement or sympathetic. And none of the papers said, you know, this is a dangerous liberal, whatever you expected them to say. Um, and I was quite shocked by that. And, and it, what I realised was that the, the population out there in the big wide world was ahead of the politicians. They were scared. The population's ahead of the politicians on this issue. And, you know, they've got family members who go and smoke dope or whatever they got. You know, it's all over. And, they, and you know, people carry on working, they get on with their lives and, and the kind of, you know, end of civilization mantra from the Tories, uh, you know, just didn't didn't resonate with people's experiences in North everyday life. So that was very interesting itself. You ask how um, it's a Tory thing. It wasn't simply a Tory thing. It was a, you get this with politicians, they're scared. They're scared to do something which is going to be controversial. So they, they stay where they are. They stick on where they are because that's an established position and they can defend it. So, you know, they don't come out and say anything. And, and you know, the same thing, by the way, they're all family, which is why they just book, you know, a lot of people who tell, a lot of them people say to me, you know, we agree with you about the royal family. They won't say so publicly, but they'll tell me privately, you know. So on, on the on the drugs thing, we, the last debate I had, that debate in, I think it was November 2014, you know, I, I, I gave it my all and said, this is what I believe in and this is everything else. And the debate's there on Hansard if you want to read it. And again, I expected a whole lot of people disagreeing with me. And it may be that the people who turned up for the debate for those who were going to agree with me. But I got support not just from my own Lib Dem colleagues, but from the Tory backbenchers, from the libertarian end of the Tory party, people like Peter Lip, who agree with me. I got it from the forward thinking people in the Labour Party who were there. The only person who spoke, the only person who spoke who disagreed with me was the official spokesman of the Labour Party in the front bench, <laughs> ironically, mm -hmm. because they were playing safe. They didn't want to take any chances. It's a sort of Mexican standoff, is it? Is it Labour and Tory will, until one of them moves, the other is scared to move just in case they get. Yeah, it's here's a law. Of, here's a law of politics. The Labour Party dare not do anything which can be presented as soft on crime by the Tories, so they don't. So they take a harder line than the Tories on law and order. The, you know, the Labour supporters don't know this, but they do. The Labour Party's position on law and order is generally harder than the Tories. You know, remember they wanted ID cards. They wanted people twenty eight days without without trial being banged up and all that sort of stuff. That was the Labour government. So if you want if you want to make progress on the drug policy front, you have to wait for the Tories to do it really, because they can get away with it. Because they seem to be sound in the better commas on law and order equally. If you're going to cut the health service, you probably want Labour to do it because they can get away with it for the same reason mm -hmm. in reverse. Well hello listeners. Uh, apologies for the interruption to the show, but I have a very exciting piece of news to share with you. In December I will be releasing my brand new book, The Brain and Mind Made Simple. Now, this is a book which has been developed from lectures I gave for drug science over the last couple of years before COVID. They went down very well. I discovered that people were very interested in their brain and very interested in their mind, and also interested in the way that drugs, both legal and illegal, cast light on those and, and affect them. So if you're interested in your brain at all, this book will take you from the very beginnings of, you know, when we're in the back in the primordial days, when the, uh, the first animals were developing a nervous system, right through into the current ways in which we can study the brain with imaging. It also gives you insights into what goes wrong in the brain. And there are chapters on all the different ways in which processes of consciousness and the content of consciousness can change with disorders such as depression, anxiety, schizophrenia. 
And also a big section on sleep as well, because that's a fascinating component of brain function, which is not well understood. Now, the book will support drug science in the, in the same way as my previous book, um, Not Uncut, did. And to celebrate the launch of the book, we're hosting a book launch in London. And this will be one of the first real-life events I've done in the past 18 months. And we're very excited to see listeners of the podcast in person at this event. So if you can make your way to London, we'd love to see you there. And of course, so you'll be able to buy the book and you'll have a, get a signed copy from me. But obviously, many of the uh, podcast listeners are from overseas, and we don't want you to miss out. So we'll also uh, host an online book launch as well. Um, if you follow us on the website, you'll know when that's going to be. And again, if you join our community, you'll be able to get special signed copies and also other access to other drug science events I'm taking part in. So now, back to the show. Hmm. But is that something that the media is essentially pulling the strings of, do you think? Or is it something in the parties themselves? I don't think the media pulls a string. I think I think what was demonstrated by the response to my medicinal cannabis intrusions was that the media was actually quite forward-looking. I mean, to be perfectly honest, probably half the journals are smoking cannabis. I mean, you know, um, and therefore they weren't going to be hypocritical about it. No, I think I think it's just it's a fear of moving on in case you get hammered for it. Politicians don't want to put their head above the parapet normally. That's what it is, as simple as that. So how are we going to change this, Norman? And we, we can't, you know, you're not, you're not, unfortunately, you had a very narrow defeat in that election, which was very unfortunate for us and, and, and progressive policies. But can we ever change it, do you think? I think we will change it. I think we will change it. And I think what's happening with cannabis in particular is, is changing matters. We're now seeing this being either decriminalised or legalised in different places across the world, not least of all in the US. And it will really change when somebody with a lot of money decides you can make profits from it. Uh, rather than sending a, a natural herbal substance, they can do something with it and then make some profit out of it. And then, then um, of course, it will become very attractive. So you know, th that, that's where it will start, uh, I think. And in a sense, that's the, I hate the phrase, it's a cliche, but low-hanging fruit of the debate is cannabis. And by the way, those who are concerned about cannabis, allegedly, the use of cannabis in the loose sense, uh, ought, in my view, reflect on the fact that natural cannabis, in my view, is rather less harmful than skunk. And they'd be rather better off legalising, you know, something which they can control and which is less harmful than what's now appearing. So, you know, I think that will change. And I think gradually people are going to realise that the so-called war on drugs is, is simply not working. I mean, it really isn't. And there's no evidence, there's no evidence that this hard line approach has ever done anything apart from drive people on the ground and push up drug use. No, absolutely. No, I couldn't, just, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, uh, but again, it's that problem of getting politicians. But, you know, in our lifetime, we have seen areas of life which was deemed completely beyond the pale, like homosexuality, yeah. become, you know, become basically legal. You know, we've seen we've, we've seen divorce, um, abortion, we've seen, we've seen yeah. those policies. And drugs seems to be the, somehow... Well, maybe the last frontier, but, but I'm wondering why it's dragged on so long. Well, I think it's that, it is that natural caution, but it's also, there hasn't been a, a particular champion, I don't think, for it. I mean, we had David Steele with his abortion bill in 67. We had Roy Jenkins as the Home Secretary. I mean, this was a very reforming time back there in the late 60s. If you look at gay rights, I mean, people were, were very vocal on that. But within Parliament, you'd feel like Chris Smith coming out uh, originally and Matthew Paris, people who are respected politicians and who people didn't suspect in the better commas of being homosexual, demonstrated that they could be quite normal people and, and get on with their lives and be very effective politicians, irrespective of who they went to bed with and what they did when they got there. So, I mean, you know, people sort of see these things and, and they think, well, actually, you know, they're not all John Inman, are they? You know, they're, 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 they're something else. So I think, you know, th the same thing will apply. And this is why I think the what I saw in Denmark was quite important. Well, these guys in suits with briefcases, effectively going to work in the in, in the equivalent of the city, I suppose, or whatever, were in, in Copenhagen, who were who were shooting up heroin and getting on with their jobs without presumably any difficulty. And I just think people have to, you know, get rid of the stereotypes and just look at the evidence. And if they do that, then we will move on. One thing that must have crossed your mind when you were uh, in government was maybe drugs shouldn't be in the Home Office. 
because there is a sort of tendency. The Home Office is about pro about stopping things rather than yeah. maybe it should be in health, which is about exactly. I made that point actually. That was that was something I tried to do. I mean, I didn't get very far with it, but I did try and do that. And actually, I got rather further with the Department of Health than I did with the Home Office because when it came to the medicinal cannabis issue, I wanted to write to Jeremy Hunt, who was in the Health Secretary, about the issue. And my private office, which was very supportive of me, my civil servants, said, if you write a letter from here, it will go through the special advisors and be stopped. So I said to them, thank you for your advice. What's Jeremy Hunt's personal email? So they gave me Jeremy Hunt's personal email. So I wrote him, I wrote him a letter as drug minister. About three hours later, Theresa May found that, went, went absolutely ballistic through the roof. And she then, having failed to respond to me for about a month on something, wrote to Jeremy Hunt immediately uh, the same day demanding that he pay no attention to what I'd written. Interestingly then, I thought, well, she stopped a bit interesting then, about two and a half weeks later, I got a letter back from Jerry Mount, which was actually quite supportive of the position I'd taken. So the Department of Health is certainly more open-minded and does look at it as a health issue. And because it does so, which is a different conclusion. So absolutely it should be the Department of Health. I mean, I think many of the, uh, the people who listen to this podcast uh, are under 30, they will be kind of rather horrified that a minister of state could have his correspondence to a, another minister of state blocked by a SPAD. I mean, actually, they may not even know what SPADs are. Do you want to explain to them what a SPAD is and, and how they work? Well, in special advisor, within, within, the, within the department, you've got ministers, three tiers, the, the Secretary of State, then the Minister of State, which is me in the Home Office, then you've got under secretaries, and there's a kind of loose hierarchy. But effectively, it comes down to Secretary of State as to how the departments run. You've then got all your civil servants, thousands of them, um, and you've then got a handful of special advisors, two or three or four maybe in each department. Now, they are political appointees who are, uh, who are there to deliver political advice. And that's no bad thing because you don't want civil servants delivering political advice. You want civil servants being neutral. So it's perfectly reasonable for a minister to have someone who comes along and says, Actually, you don't want to put that nuclear power station in, in Hartlepool because it's a marginal seat or we'll somewhere else. You know, that's what sort of thing they were talking about. And, you know, that, that's political reality. And it's better that they do that rather than um, civil servants do it. So special advisors come in, like anybody else, they come in all shapes and sizes. And it depends on the personalities involved. The special advisors at the Department of Transport, I, who were Tory special advisors, were actually very nice people. And one of them... Um, when I, when I went to the Home Office, sent me a text saying, come back. I mean, they're very nice people. That was Julian. And you know, the ones at the Home Office were entirely different. You had Nick Timothy and Fiona Hill. Oh, the famous two, yes. Famous two. And who, who were, uh, I didn't mind Fiona, she, she was all right in a way. I mean, she was hard-nosed and very loyal to Teresa, but she was, she was a human being. And I went for a drink with her and stuff like that. I mean, she was okay. And Nick Timothy was something else indeed. And they had a reign of terror which operated over civil servants, including just almost describing exactly what words had to be used in a particular occasion. It was, it was they, ran, they ran the entire department, two of them, you know, which was not practical or, or, or sensible. And, you know, they, they um, and had endless arguments with them about things. They went to number 10 eventually, of course, with Theresa May. And Theresa May tried to do the same thing at number 10 as she had done in the home office. Well, you know, as one of the journalists said to me, you can't land every single plane in government on two runways, which is what you were trying to do. So that, that's one of the reasons number 10 didn't work for Theresa May. But the special advisor, so the special advisor had an enormous power in the Home Office. And in fact, I, I remember saying to Theresa May one time, because she was quite reasonable sometimes, I said to her, I remember saying to her, you know, Theresa, why don't you do what you think is right rather than two special advisors? Because actually, in my view, this is kind of the truth. In my view, you're actually probably got better judgment than they have on some issues. So why are you listening to them all the time? And she said to me, this is a phrase I all remember, remember, she said, they are my voice. So I thought it was a really creepy thing to say. Wow, yes. Well, let's talk about something a bit more positive, because you were one of the <laughs> pioneers of the Green Revolution, weren't you? And, which is why there's a bicycle on the front of your book, and you're very into reducing CO2 when you're in the Department of Transport. And uh, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, well, I, when I first got involved in politics, I didn't know whether to become a Liberal or a Green, because... I'm both committed to a green philosophy on the environment and also to the great liberal issue, which is the balance between the state and the individual, which liberals champion 
and want devolution, and, and actually think that she was to be not given too much power. Unfortunately, the opposite was happening at the moment. So mm. I, I had both those strands in me. So, I, so unusually, I joined both parties at the same time to see what they looked like. <laughs> um, the Liberals were a bit more organised, so I stayed with them. In fact, I got asked to stand for the council, and then I took off from there. So that's uh, what happened there. But the reason I, I, I wanted to do transport was because in opposition, I had for a while shadowed the environment brief. And the environment brief was a bit about agriculture, which is not unimportant, and quite a lot about polar bears and so on, which, you know, I'm all in favour of polar bears, but, you know, the world's not just polar bears, it's something else. So, and I, and I found that it wasn't really, you know, terribly, you know, you couldn't get your hands dirty in the brief, it was quite an esoteric brief. So I wanted to make a difference, and I thought, well, you know, a third of emissions are coming from transport. There's a whole lot wrong with transport. Let's get in there and make a difference in people's lives in terms of transport, but also cut carbon emissions at the same time. So, it was a, so I went there for environmental reasons. But I asked to go there. Before the 2010 election, I said to Nick Clegg, there's going to be a coalition. There's going to be a hung parliament. We should do a deal with the Tories, not because I'm particularly that way inclined, but because you couldn't be seen to prop up Gordon Brown. The electorate wouldn't have stopped yeah, that. Yeah. If we do a deal with the Tories, we should be in the front seat driving with them rather than the back seat. So we should do a coalition. And can I become transport minister, please? And that conversation I had with Nick Clegg, and it all came true. Yeah, and you're a great champion of, of railways, I think. you. I love railways. I, many years ago, back in the 1980s, for a short period, I worked for British Rail. And one of my, we all make mistakes in life, Dave, don't we? One of my mistakes was not quite staying long enough. If I stayed at British Rail slightly longer, I would have got free first class trouble for life. And I missed that by... So there we are. Well, I remember travelling down with you from Victoria to uh, yeah. to Lewis in the out that to 2015 election, trying to hopefully get you re-elected, and, and so you lost by a very very small margin. What do you think was going on? How did a party that did actually did as much as you actually know you know we know you did in in opposition? How did they people manage to sort of so sideline you so so effectively? It just seem, doesn't seem just. In 2015. Well, no. it's, it's it's pretty straightforward. I mean, the in order to win, we had to rely on tactical voting from Labour and Green voters. I think in virtually every seat we win, we have to do that. And the deal for Labour and Green voters is to get someone who's not a Tory. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's a kind of unwritten deal. And in 2010, the, and, and all the previous elections, I'd got most of the Labour and Green votes. In 2015, you wouldn't do it because he said, You've been in bed with the Tories. And I said, well, you know, I can argue about why we did that and go through the history of it. I said, but to cut to, to, cut to the quick, you know, in this constituency, well, get me or a Tory. That's a choice. Labour's never come anywhere near winning it, let alone the Greens. And, you know, you get me or the Tories. So you may not like the fact I went to coalition with the Tories, but if you don't vote for me, you get the Tory. And they wouldn't vote for me. And therefore the Labour Green vote went up, hopelessly went up. And it got no nowhere near winning, of course. But my vote came down sufficiently to let the Tories in. And, you know, the, and the irony is that those people who are most opposed to Tories were the ones who didn't vote for <laughs> well, Yeah, I see, yeah. The Tories in. And, you know, the way, the, way they, the way I described it in my book, actually, which you kind of uh, mentioned at the beginning, was that, um, you know, they were drinking champagne during election day, having voted the way they wanted to vote. And they've had a hangover ever since. <laughs> yes. <laughs> quite, quite, yes. So what are you doing now, then? So what, one other point on that election was, here's a statistic for you. If all the people who were Labour and Green supporters who had voted tactically for us in 2010 had voted tacti tactically again for us in 2015, there would not have been a Tory government. Mm. They brought it up, I'm sorry to say, they, they caused a Tory government to occur. What am I doing now? Yeah, what are you up to now then? I'm doing 101 different things, David. It's quite nice. I've managed to create this little portfolio of bits and pieces, which keeps me busy. I do two and a half days a week advising the campaign for better transport, which is nice. So I do, I do that. that's, that's my base occupation, base income. And then I do a whole lot of freelance stuff. Uh, I've written three books, as you, as I mentioned, the last one, The Royal Family, which is doing well. Well, you, we've talked about your uh, your autobiography, Against the Grain, which is a great read, but you've told me you've done, what about The Royal Family since? I, I hadn't heard about that. Do you want to share that with us? Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's, it's going very well. It actually got in... Um, some Amazon list. It was, it's called, and what do you do? What the Royal Family don't want you to know. 
and essentially it's it's um well it's it's an, it, it, the idiocy and the sheer absurdity of the royal family on the one hand but also the nastiness that all the tax breaks all the way the influence legislation behind the scenes all the way they use that influence quite improperly for an unelected family and the book's gone very well and of course it was very well timed i mean I, not my not my doing the timing but i mean the fact is it came out we had prince andrew and all his business with uh, jeffrey epstein with harry and megan going off to california so it's actually sold very well it's it's, it's uh, it was at harback originally 2019 uh last year it was um i updated it, it came out in paperback last year and it's also an audio book and spot not spotify um download or whatever else it is kindle or something so it's, it's actually done very well so i i do that and that's that spun apart from um the book selling well it's also spun a whole lot of other stuff so i've been doing i've done columns and newspaper on the rolls been involved in a couple of documentaries a couple of podcasts and so on so that's that's been quite a rich vein in that well, sense good well i hope some of my listeners uh pick up pick up copies i don't i don't think i have many royalist listeners somehow <laughs> so you might have a very good reception i i would say that the royalists a lot of the royalists who read my book are not royalists at the end of it so i've done all that and i've also been I also write columns for other columns for national papers and magazines. Um, I've been um, commissioned by um, Miss Gondoray and, and Matrix Chambers to do some work on the espionage bills coming to Parliament. I've been involved in um, this, is, this morning, I just finished actually, a uh, report for a, a college in London which is having a dispute with the government. So all sorts of different bits and pieces, which is very nice. So you're keeping your intellect sharp. Well, I want to talk to you one about one last thing, which I think is a, is a kind of testimony to the fact that you're prepared to ask awkward questions and actually think through situations which have, have been glossed over. And that was the um, the Kelly death. Yeah. And um, so probably you can explain it better than me, but explain, you know, what happened. But also then why you were so det I mean, it's unusual for a politician to write a book while they're in politics about how the government or society has covered up what you think might be a murder. Do you want to just share that with the, with the audience? Yes, I mean, David Kelly, I mean, this is now 18 years old and it's conceivable some of your listeners have even been born, I suppose. And, and this no, I think not, yeah. Da David Kelly was um, the um, a British weapons inspector for the UN, highly respected man, uh, did a great deal to expose uh, improper an illegal use of, or, or, or production at least of nuclear, or of, um, sorry, weapons of mass destruction, chemical and biological weapons uh, in places like Russia and Iraq in the past. And uh, of course, 2003 was the time when um, the Americans and British invaded Iraq on the basis that there were weapons of mass destruction there, which of course was a tissue of lies. And by the way, there's a great deal to damage MPs' reputations when it became clear as a tissue of lies. And David Kelly, who was our prime weapons inspector, knew that this was, was not true. He knew the whole thing was being hyped up or sexed up, as I think the BBC described sexed it. Sexed up, time. yeah. And, you know, he then made this known to Andrew Gilligan, who's now at number 10 Downing Street, who then produced a report on the Today programme and really set the cats loose out of the bag, or whatever the phrase is. Uh, not out of the bag, let, let the cats run wild. And David Kelly then found himself, cut a long story short, in the middle of a, 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 a furore, including having been thrust in the limelight by the Defence Select Committee. His name was was effectively pushed out there by the by the Ministry of Defence, quite improperly, one of their employees. He had a bit of a torrid time. Uh, and then in July 2003, he was found dead on Harrowdown Hill, having, by the way, predicted he might be found dead in the woods about six months earlier. He was found dead on Harrowdown Hill. And immediately, and I say immediately, within a matter of a couple of hours, he was declared he committed suicide. And the government then announced an inquiry or through Alistair Campbell. I mean, this is all happening immediately afterwards, an astonishing speed, same day, announced an inquiry into this death of David Kelly. And he appointed Lord Hutton, who had never chaired an inquiry in his life before, other than into the diversion of a river in Northern Ireland, to look at this matter. Lord Hutton then held this inquiry. The BBC turned out to be on trial rather than anything else. And at the end of it, the BBC was found guilty by Lord Hutton. The government got off scot-free despite their false documents and their fake weapons of mass destruction dossiers. 
and poor old David Kelly got better looking. Lord Hutton even admitted afterwards in a publication called the Inner Temple Yearbook. It's a racy publication, I'm sure it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Reg <laughs> Good for bedtime reading. <laughs> Indeed, if you're going to sleep. Admitted afterwards that um, he hadn't bothered looking into the case very deeply because he thought the facts were unknown. I mean, what an astonishing thing to say. And, and this is the key thing, perhaps. It was a non-statutory inquiry. You know, when somebody dies in this country in unexplained, unexplained circumstances, there is a coroner's inquest. That's what happens. And a coroner's inquest is held to a particular standard. Witnesses can be compelled to attend. They have to give evidence under oath. It's all in public. There's cross-examination, proper cross-examination, proper rules of court apply. And at the end, if you're going to reach a verdict of suicide, it has to be beyond reasonable doubt. That is what happens in a coroner's court. This was a non-statutory inquiry. It had no more formal basis than me talking to you now. Key witnesses didn't occur, didn't, didn't turn up, weren't invited to attend. The, the police officer in charge of the, of the investigation wasn't even mentioned, let alone turn up with your evidence. David Kelly's key friends who knew about things and I spoke to her for an hour on the phone wasn't invited to come. She offered to come on, was, was turned down to this so-called inquiry. A series of doctors produced statements to say that clinically it was impossible for David Kelly to have died the way that was described. He could not have committed suicide through cutting his ulnar artery, wasn't it, supposedly? Ulnar artery, which is, which is match, match stick thickness in your, in your wrist, cutting it with a blunt knife, which would have also been very difficult to, 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 make, to make it clear. There was no blood around the body. I mean, the whole thing is just a, it's just a joke, to be honest with you, a complete joke. And that's what forced you to, you, you thought it was just so appalling. You had to write a book about it, to expose it. I did, because uh, it, it was quite clear that, you know, there were, there were elephants in rooms and no one was looking at them. And why weren't they looking at them? And I could, un I could understand the government wanted to hush the whole thing up and getting a, a, a patsy like Lord Hutton to chair the inquiry. But why wasn't the press doing something about it? I mean, the press was completely useless. They really were. And because the press was doing nothing about it, I did something about it, and I found out all sorts of stuff the press should have found out, let alone Lord Hutton. I mean, for example, I found, through Freedom of Information request to Thames Valley Police, there were no fingerprints on the knife that David Kelly supposed to have used. And there was... <laughs> he wiped it clear after, clean after he cut himself, didn't he? <laughs> and he wasn't wearing gloves. So what was your, you know, what did he do? Did he wipe the knife clean after he? I mean, God's sake! I mean, this is just so unbelievable. And that's just one example. I mean, it's all set out in my book, but I just thought, you know, this is this is not right. I'm sorry, I believe I believe in proper procedure. There should be a coroner's inquest. And 18 years on, in 2021, there is still to be no coroner's inquest into David Kelly's death. 18 years on. So I, I guess you suppose it was murder, and it was, and, you know, shut him up because people wanted to believe in the just war. They wanted to believe that there were weapons, and, and he was just well, getting in the way. Huh? As to, as to what happened, I mean, there are a number of possible explanations. I mean, one possible explanation that a journalist, one of the brave journalists who does this, very few brave journalists, Miles Goslett, who's also written a book on David Kelly more recently, his theory is that David Kelly was being interrogated by the MOD and had a heart attack on them, and they couldn't face the prospect that he died under interrogation, as it were, uh -huh, and therefore uh -huh. a suicide was faked. Now, I don't know whether that's or whether was, he was bumped off, but what we do know, 100%, is it was not suicide. I challenge anyone to say on the basis of the evidence produced that beyond reasonable doubt, coroner's inquest test, that was suicide. I challenge anyone to prove that. Well, Norman, yeah, I think, as I said at the beginning, you know, you're a, a remarkable politician. You're, you're certainly the first, as I said, the first drugs minister I've come across who's actually prepared to have an open mind about drugs. And your, your career tells us that you've, uh, you've actually tried to get to the truth of very many things. And, uh, and I thank you for that. And uh, it's a pity you're still not there uh, goading them and forcing them to actually fess up and, and actually behave in a professional way. But thank you for what you've done. Thank you for coming on the sure. podcast. And I look forward to reading your new book, which is called What Do You Do? Question mark, is it? And uh, what do you do? And what do you think the nation right? And what do you do? Because that's what the Queen asks you when you meet her, you see. And what do you do? Or what... Yes, that's it. Anyway, David, it's, it's an anniversary this year. It's 50 years since uh, the 1971 Mysteries of Drugs Act this year. And that has still not been un unwound. That was, a, that was a kind of knee jerk reaction to by the establishment who were frightened of the swinging 60s. It's going to be out of control. It's clamped down on it. That's what it was. And the swinging 60s became the swinging 70s. And that's what we got. 
And it's still there. So there's a task to be done, which is unwinding this ridiculous piece of legislation, which has made drug use more endemic, made health outcomes worse, and made criminals of law-abiding people. Yes, well, indeed, I couldn't agree with you more. And if, as you know, uh, drug science is pulling together a volume of uh, of chapters on, on the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971 and how it's got wrong and how we can take it forward. And I'm delighted to say that Norman has agreed to write the preface. So uh, we look forward to that. And I'll, I'll be sending you the list of the chapters for you to reflect okay. on that. But you've got six months, Norman, and it'll only be a thousand words. So you can probably knock that off in an afternoon. <laughs> well, I'm sure, I'm sure three, three, but that's going to be six months, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, Norman, thanks again for joining us. It's been very illuminating. And uh, I wish you well in all your future endeavors. Thank you for coming on to the podcast. Thank you very much. All the best to you, Dave. Thank you for what you do as well. Thank you.